For more than 50 years, the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations has been the leader in promoting mutual understanding between the United States and China, the most important relationship of the 21st century. The National Committee strengthens that relationship by helping people on both sides of the Pacific to understand one another better and to address issues of mutual concern through exchanges, dialogues, and other activities. These programs address key issues, such as economic relations, rule of law, security, public health, and the environment, in the belief that constructive Sino-American relations benefit both countries as well as the global community. I'm Steve Orlins, president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I am pleased to welcome audiences from over 80 venues throughout the United States, Canada, and China to our 16th annual China Town Hall. U.S.-China relations matter. As the two most important countries in the world, what our countries do has implications across the globe. The past few years have seen discord replace diplomacy, while areas for cooperation have decreased. Whether it's soaring inflation, pandemic prevention, climate change, or Russia's invasion of Ukraine, our countries are safer and more prosperous when we work together. Understanding both the risks and the benefits of working with China is critical to protecting our national security and economic prosperity. We are fortunate to have one of America's great public servants with us today. John Huntsman Jr. not only was governor of Utah for two terms, he was our ambassador to China, Russia, and Singapore. There are few Americans with his depth and breadth of experience, so we are thrilled to have him with us to discuss these pressing issues and answer your questions. I am proud to call John a friend. Thank you, John, for being here, and thank you for stopping between Israel and Detroit. <laughs> I'd also like to thank our speakers and partners across the United States and China for hosting this event. Thank you also to the Star Foundation for its continued generosity in funding China Town Hall and to our National Committee staff for working hard to coordinate this nationwide event. To participate in the conversation on Twitter, use the hashtag CTH2022. Let me now begin with a few of my own questions for Ambassador Huntsman. Ambassador Huntsman, I can't help but call you John, but Ambassador Huntsman, the... Uh, John will do, Steve. Yes, the, <laughs> the, the, uh, there have been some very important developments over the last few days. We've had the midterm elections. Uh, we've had President Xi and President Biden meeting in Bali. What are the implications of both of those for U.S.-China relations? Well, thanks, David. It's a pleasure to be with you. And we so appreciate your leadership at the National Committee and your years of dedicated leadership in helping to build uh, the bilateral relationship. And it's been great to be on your board uh, to watch you in action. So thank you. And thanks to so many who are out in the viewing audience for their interest in the subject matter, because there is no other subject in international relations more important than this one. Uh, and so that takes us to your question. And as a practitioner, not an expert, but as a practitioner in the world of politics and international affairs, I'd have to say that the outcome of the midterm election was a good one. Uh, and I say that because I think the balance now between both parties, you don't have extremist factions on one side or the other that are going to dominate in the House of Representatives specifically. We know the Senate is straight up 50-50. Uh, but in the House, I think we should expect more responsible behavior, uh, maybe more focus on realpolitik, uh, on approaches that would support our extended deterrence in the Asia Pacific region, uh, more of a focus on trade, which I think is an area where we've woefully underperformed in, in recent years, uh, and on trying to figure out how best to use our 
tools of national strength and power. So when you're closely divided in a political body like the House of Representatives, or the Senate, you have to work together. Uh, you don't have one side or the other that can march off uh, on, on a tangent uh, that just sort of makes little sense given the broader picture and the stakes are U.S. national interests, for example. So my hope is that we have more people sitting down uh, at the important committee levels, rolling up their sleeves and figuring out how best to A, define our national interests. So what are our national interests as it relates to U.S.-China relations? We rarely sit down and talk about that. B, what are the best modalities by which we can execute on those, uh, on those national interests? The legislative branch is going to want to play a role. The executive branch obviously leads out on, uh, on issues of national security. So I think that's a good outcome. Uh, having President Biden uh, meet with Xi Jinping in person, first time in a couple of years. Uh, look at all of the, uh, the events that have played out in the last two years, pandemic, war in Europe, energy crises, inflation, uh, economic spirals, and then the overall deterioration in the bilateral relationship, the most important the world, I think, has ever known. To have the President of the United States and Xi Jinping, not by way of a screen uh, or a long distance phone call, but actually being in person, sizing each other up, although they're old friends and they've spent time together before, but given all that has transpired in the last few years to be able to sit down look at each other in the eye and begin to reintroduce the stakes and the interests on both sides uh, and to update one another on respectively what is going on uh, on both sides of the Pacific, I think is really important. And they can do it kind of as difficult as it might be given the challenges uh, and the stresses and strains in the bilateral relationship. They can do it with a smile. So what did I hear from my friends in China this morning? Wow, the front pages of the papers in China, they had both leaders actually smiling, who would have guessed? So maybe that is a positive harbinger for the important work that lies ahead. But you know, once every two years, once every three years, getting the heads of state together is not enough. The stakes are way too high. And the issues have to be defined by way of an agenda. We have to know exactly how that agenda matches our, na our national interests. And we have to kind of reintroduce each other. It's been a long winter, so to speak. And China has gone through a lot of changes. They've made decisions that have made the relationship very difficult. I know they would point a finger at us for having done the same thing. So in that kind of climate, personal interaction uh, and those of the key staff members, I was pleased to read that Tony Blinken will lead an effort to maybe re-engage at a senior cabinet level. Um, all of that is really important, but as we look at it and as they evaluate the steps going forward, I think we really need to learn from the past in terms of what has worked and what has not worked, because clearly there have been chapters of things that have worked better than others. Mm -hmm. So you think Secretary Blinken going over to China is a good thing and additional cabinet exchanges would be extremely useful, I assume. Well, the stakes are, are so high in so many areas that having a conduit by which we can sit down and talk, not that we should expect immediate results. I don't think we're going to see any immediate results. I think the relationship is just too, too calcified. It's too frozen right now. But where do you start? This is a people's game. I mean, diplomacy is a people's game. It can't work any other way. You can't rely on technology. Uh, you can't... Uh, rely on intermediaries, you have to just roll up your sleeves and get it done. So in a sense, we're starting with a, with a fresh piece of paper in a new environment that is highly charged, that is way more complicated than it was before. So when we did this town hall, Steve, together 12 years ago, yeah. I was sitting in Beijing as a U.S. ambassador. Friendlier times, we had our challenges to be sure, but things have uh, gotten way worse in the years since. And to be able to bring our senior officials together to begin that process of defining the priorities in the bilateral relationship, which has not been done in a very long time, I think is, I think is, is a positive. I saw He Lifeng, who is likely to become vice premier in charge of economic uh, matters in China, and Janet Yellen were present. Do you think the political environment is will allow for a, an ending of the tariffs which were imposed when you were actually ambassador to Russia. Right. 
Uh, and, you know, in a time of, uh, of inflation, in a time of uh, slack economic performance, what's the worst thing you can have uh, in a trading relationship? It's tariffs, and in this case, that you know, reach 27 and a half percent. So, you know, my day job is in the car business, you know, working for Ford Motor Company. And when we look at bilateral trade, which has reached numbers that would represent the largest trading relationship in a sense the world has ever known, uh, that, it, that doesn't serve consumers. That doesn't serve economic growth and stability. So it then becomes a political question. You know, will the political bodies and individuals that are responsible for this, will they, will they have the uh, the right stuff to be able to to change that tariff schedule. I, I'm I'm not totally confident that that will happen. I hope that it does because we need a, a kind of a fresh start on the on the trade and economic side. Uh, but we'll see. Yeah. Doesn't the tariffs punish kind of lower income Americans more than wealthier Americans and lead to trade distortions? And isn't it kind of puzzling that the Biden administration has not kind of harvested that low-hanging fruit of cutting those tariffs? To me, as a former trade negotiator, Steve, uh, as someone who's worked on U.S.-China trade <laughs> and trade throughout the Asia-Pacific region, I see trade as our most powerful weapon. Well, I should say our most powerful weapon are our people. Uh, on both sides of the Pacific. And this is, you know, this should be all about the people of the United States and the people of China. We have differing uh, governance systems and obviously different uh, uh, ideological priorities, but people to people, we do pretty well. But the people to people stuff is supercharged by way of economics and trade. And uh, there's way more that we can get out of the relationship in terms of overall stability through trade than we're getting today. So yes, uh, to me, that would have been an early low-hanging fruit to, to attack. But the political environment is such that if anyone steps in that direction, they're seen as weak. And we have to get to a point where we're beyond the point scoring. We're doing what's right for our people. Uh, we're doing what's right for our citizens and consumers. And, and long-term, the stability of a bilateral relationship that left to his own devices will become more and more estranged, and that's a dangerous place for it to be. So what is a glue that kind of brings us together at the most elementary level? It's trade. Yeah. Likely we'll have a Speaker McCarthy. How does that affect this discussion? Well, he's going to have a very thin majority. And I think for him who chairs some of the key committees will be absolutely critical. Ways and means that deals with trade policy. So I said earlier that I think we've way underplayed our hand on trade. So part of an extension of our national interests is interacting with our friends and allies in the Asia Pacific region. And what do they want? Well, obviously they want dialogue in a lot of different areas, but they want to trade. Um, and I think the best way to shore up our presence in the region which has, I think, become slack and uh, in, a, in a sense underperforming where we should be as a superpower is through, tr through trade. And so the committee assignments and who chairs these committees is going to be really important. On the foreign policy side, you know, ideas around extended deterrence and our traditional alliances, how we tend to those, because that's, that's a factor in the overall bilateral relationship, no question about it. In the last couple of days, the National Committee has released what we call a track to consensus document, where we and the Chinese have agreed um, to call for greater cooperation in health care. Let's take our first audience question uh, from Crystal Thomas, who's watching with the Schwarzman Scholars alumni community in New York. Good evening, Ambassador Huntsman. My name is Crystal Thomas, and I'm currently a medical student as well as a Schwarzman Scholar. And here's my question. Our experience with COVID-19 has given us an example of what can happen when countries fail to collaborate with each other on public health issues, particularly in the realms of knowledge sharing and resource sharing. How can we incentivize countries, particularly the US and China, to be better actors so that when the next highly contagious disease comes our way, we can avoid the same amount of vast damage and destruction that COVID-19 brought us? Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. and, and th Thank you for being a Schwartzman Scholar. What an impressive thing, my goodness. Um, the question is a good one. So at one point, 
uh, I approached an earlier Secretary for Health and Human Services in the United States about collaboration in healthcare. So to me, when you're living in Beijing as a chief of mission, you look at all of the levers of influence in the bilateral relationship where we can do good. Uh, not just good from a straight up geopolitical standpoint, but good for our people. So, so what is good for humanity? That, that's the question that I had. Well, if you stop to conclude that between the United States and China, we have some of the best and smartest uh, medical practitioners, researchers in the world, supplemented by some of the best lab, laboratory facilities anywhere on earth. So I used to chair a cancer institute out, uh, out west. You walk in the Cancer Institute and it's an amalgamation of people from all over the world, bright PhD uh, researchers and, uh, and MD clinicians working together in solving some of the most difficult mysteries around, uh, this, uh, around science and health. Uh, well, you look at the laboratory, a lot of them are from China. And it, it, it dawned on me that, okay, if this is the case in many of our laboratories in the United States, why aren't we pooling knowledge and collaborating a little more deeply around human disease? Because human disease strikes everybody. It strikes the people in China, it strikes people in the United States and beyond. So as it relates to COVID, that's a no-brainer. So COVID's been somewhat of a disaster on both sides. I mean, the whole economy has been closed down uh, in China. And I think in large part because Xi Jinping saw that as an extension of his legitimacy. Any kind of outbreak would have weakened his, his legitimacy as a leader, particularly in the run-up to the 20th Party Congress. And in the United States, it's, it's been kind of a patchwork of different approaches, and it, it's been really troubling. But would we be better off if we were to pool our knowledge, put aside the rhetoric and the finger pointing and the blame game and all of that, to say, how can we best serve humanity? How can we best serve the people on both sides of the Pacific? Because there will be a next outbreak of something. There will be a next major public health concern. And I think our people on both sides would be way better served if we were smarter about approaching it with the power of collaboration. Yeah. I mean, I think China is now experiencing a very severe, by their standards, very severe outbreak. Um, you know, probably I think 14, 15,000 cases a day, new cases a day. How does China kind of exit from these lockdowns that are, you know, about a tenth of the Chinese population is now under some form of lockdown. How does China exit from that? And what does it mean for kind of U.S.-China relations if it can't exit? Well, if it can't exit, it has a hugely negative impact on our economic relationship, which is central to the overall relationship. So right now, the supply lines and supply chains are gummed up like they've never been in history in large part because of the COVID outbreak in China. So just in trying to put uh, supply chains together for the automotive sector, which is some of the most complicated in the world, the extent to which we have gone to fly and helicopter and in any other way to get products from various locations to final assembly destinations way more expensive. It, it means people are gonna be making choices that are different than those traditionally with uh, Chinese vendors uh, and suppliers, uh, which will have a diminution effect on the overall bilateral relationship, which is not good. Because this has always been a stabilizer. Politics can get way out of hand, but the economics has always been kind of a stabilizer in the bilateral relationship. This could have a real negative impact, a real toll on that stabilizing element. How they get out of it is, is, is clearly up to them. I think now that they're in the post-Congress phase, I mean, they've got the Lianghui ahead in March, which will be kind of an interpretation by the, by the state uh, of what transpired uh, last month. Uh, my sense is they'll begin to open up a little bit more because the pressure isn't there pre-party Congress to keep it at zero or to ensure that Xi Jinping's political legitimacy is in no way threatened by a massive outbreak. Um, let's go to our next question from Leon Tang in uh, Jersey City. Hello, this is Leon Tang from New Jersey. President Biden recently issued a total ban of a technology export to China in the semiconductor industry, which effectively wiped off a large portion market cap of companies such as Qualcomm, NVIDIA, and Intel. As we know, there's a high probability for us to have a recession in the near term. How would this act really impact our economy in the near, mid, and long term in the future? Thank you very much. 
So this was specific to the CHIPS Act. Um, so I think one uh, aspect of the bilateral relationship we're going to see supercharged, and one that I think is good, actually, is bringing out the competitive features of our bilateral relationship, because we're good competitors. We do it well, uh, and that brings out the best in innovation, which always brings, I think, good dividends. So if we're competing, we're probably less directly hostile to one another. Uh, competition is good, and we've been at a disadvantage with respect to certain key product inputs to some of our finished products because of the migration overseas of critical components, including semiconductors. So in a country like ours that once dominated 30% of the industry, or maybe Europe that dominated 25% of the semiconductor industry, we're down now to single digits, and, and Europe the same. So there's been a migration outward. <clears throat> so the ability for the United States to onshore so I'm a free trader, but I also recognize that competition today is sometimes played a little differently, uh, is going to be something that I think Congress in a bilateral fashion is, uh, is fixated on. And U.S. industry, I'll be at a semiconductor conference out west in a couple of days where we'll be talking about exactly this, uh, how it uh, will be finally formulated and executed, uh, the CHIPS Act I'm referring to, the $52 billion in support yeah. of semiconductors. But what I think you're going to see is a rebuilding of our domestic competency around critical materials, and there's none more so than, uh, than ships, uh, semiconductors. It's also to be expected, as we've seen in export control laws, policies, that <clears throat> the smaller nanometer-sized chips, which, of course, can be used in weapons production, uh, et cetera, et cetera, are, are, are going to be targeted uh, as chips that we don't want in circulation. Uh, but the larger nanometer sized chips will still, I think, be in circulation as part of our overall trading relationship. But what, what we can expect is to see more chip production here in the United States. How did the prohibition on certain chips affect the automotive industry or in China? In other words, your work? Very little. So, we so those chips are still being able to be imported or they're produced in China? Well, we get, we get a lot of them from, from Korea, uh, from Taiwan, uh, some componentry from, from, uh, from China. So if you stop to think that an F-150, you know, a, an iconic car that we make at Ford, has a little over 1,700 chips in it. Your iPhone will maybe have 20 or 30 chips. A car, a sophisticated car, has about 1,700. Most all of them, if not all of them, are a higher nanometer size chip, whether for windshield wiper blades, for the tech stack, for your uh, heated mirror system, for seats that go back and forth. So they're not directly impacted, but the smaller nanometer size chips go into other more sophisticated products, consumer electronics and other things, will most definitely be impacted. Can we, should we as a country, in other words, well, obviously we have taken, as the questioner referred to, we have reduced our chip companies' revenues by billions and billions of dollars. So we've reduced their R&D budget. Should we as a country live with that or should we try and have what, what we, when I was in government, we called NU certifications. So if you're going to use a chip, for cancer research or for you know various kinds of AI that is not uh, antithetical to the United States, that's okay. If you're going to use it uh, for for, soup, for for military uses, that's no good. Right. Should we be moving in that direction? Well, that's why they have exceptions. So you'll have companies that will apply for exceptions or exemptions in this case. So you take the sledgehammer from a policy standpoint and you roll it out and then you live with it for a little while and you see that maybe refinements have to be made. And no doubt this will, this will evolve in a similar fashion. So you're, you're not worried that it's gonna permanently uh, cripple our chip industry? No, I think the chip industry is gonna be okay longer term. I look at the tens of billions of dollars that have already been announced between places like Arizona and Ohio for new foundries. Yeah. And I think it's actually a really good thing for this country that we're gonna be back in the business of something as important yeah. and as basically essential to manufacturing as semiconductors. That's a good thing. Yep, I except obviously the U.S. taxpayer is, is footing the bill as well, opposed to the Chinese, formerly when the Chinese were buying the chips, they in effect were 
footing the bill for the R&D in the United States. Except, so it's, it's a bit of a... Yeah, except when you stop to think that the revenues generated uh, and the research and development that will occur here will be a net positive for the U.S. economy. Uh -huh. One of the questions that people are asking in Arizona, in Ohio, is do we have the labor force? This requires a certain number of engineers, and do we have the labor force? And given the limitations that were put on H-1Bs, uh, Chinese coming to the United States work, a lot of these people are going to be Chinese. Right, right. Can, can we actually do it? Are we, gonna, are we going to be able to accomplish the purposes that you're talking about? Well, we're about to find out, but I will tell you, as a, as a former governor, we don't have nearly enough of our young kids who are going into the STEM field, right. where China might be graduating a quarter of all STEM grads globally uh, every year. We are not. And maybe this gives us an opportunity, because listen, as a governor in a state like Arizona or Ohio or beyond, you have an opportunity to rev up certain programmatic areas in public education. Uh, and if I were a governor in either of those states, I'd say, okay, this investment is really important to our future and we need the labor force to be able to support it. That means we're gonna work with public education or universities to make sure that we're producing enough STEM. That's all part of the competitive equation. But my, my, my experience is we are behind in this area and painfully so. Uh, and if we're gonna be investing tens of billions of dollars in the technologies of tomorrow, which we're doing, we need the workforce for tomorrow as well. Yeah. We've broken ground on these facilities already. Yes. That, that it's now occurring, you know, Intel, TSMC, and others. Yes. It's going to take a long time. Yes, to, three to five years. To, but it's going to take a long time to get a workforce. Even longer. Yes, it's going to be even longer. Shouldn't we be changing our immigration policy to oh, take this into account? Of course. Every, every major uh, innovator breakthrough that, I mean, look at Silicon Valley. I don't need to tell, tell you, Steve, I, I was here in Palo Alto last week giving a speech, and it's a diverse polyglot of a community where people come together, the best and the brightest of the world, to make things happen. And that's been the magic of the United States system. Nobody quite does it like we do. And if we begin to fiddle with that uh, for political reasons, we, we, we do ourselves grave damage over time from an innovation standpoint. And we've always been the innovation capital of the world. Now, as a governor, as a former governor, not a, you've not only been a former governor, but obviously worked in the in the federal government. Um, a lot of the interaction today between China it's shifted somewhat because of the national security concerns of the federal government. A lot has has shifted to the subnational level, so states, cities, etc. So we've got a question on this from uh, Jacob in Seattle. Hello, Ambassador Huntsman. My name is Jacob Wood from Seattle, Washington. My question is this. While there is understandably lots of talk about the growing tensions and subsequent challenges of the U.S.-China relationship, what, if any, opportunities do you see for advancing engagement between the two countries? And what role can and should states like the wonderful Washington state be playing in strengthening U.S.-China ties? Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. And, and Washington State is a wonderful state. I had a stun station there in the Navy. And so I visited the Anacortes, uh, the Whidbey Island area, uh, quite a bit and, and loved, loved the state. I've always been a proponent, Steve, of subnational engagement. I think it is, a, uh, it is a multiplier. It's a net benefit to the United States. And I think it's a net benefit longer term to the citizens of China. Again, this is one of these areas where it's a people to people thing. And I think people-to-people -people engagement should be the heart and soul of our engagement with China. While we have deep disagreements uh, on, the, on the political side, uh, on the security side, on the ide ideology side, on the governance side, the people-to-people -people engagement has to remain solid. If we become estranged there, heaven forbid what the outcome might be because it, it, it could be dangerous and catastrophic. So the subnational level really does allow us to engage at a, at a very meaningful people-to-people -people level municipal level, state level. So what is it that we can learn about transportation systems? What is it that we can learn about water management? So out in the western part of the United States, because of climate change, you've got the Colorado River that is drying up. You've got other reservoirs that are drying up. Well, guess what? China has the same problem. So if you kind of scratch the surface a little bit, you'll find that, that, that China has some very severe water shortage problems. So what are we doing about that? Who's coming up with solutions and fixes? Well, working together, we can probably find better 
ways forward in terms of how we deal with something as important as water. Education, healthcare, transportation, we're all kind of, I found as I met with governors of provinces in China, we'd sit down and instinctively we would speak the same language because we're working on the same thing. You're working on issues that deal with your people. And so instinctively you go to, how are they being educated? How is healthcare working? How efficient are your cities and towns? So yes, Jacob, there's a lot to be gained there. The fear factor will be part of this, and that is, should we engage, should we not? Uh, local politicians will say, can I get ahead politically if I am seen as collaborating with China? I think in this case, we have to put people first and say what's best for our citizens. And uh, I know, listen, I know all the arguments against it. I've lived this for decades, but I think there's more to be gained uh, through subnational people-to-people engagement at the municipal and state level. Though Utah is a little unusual, it's, it has a much more outward-facing culture than many other states. So. Yes, and, and what is unique about the United States that I would, you know, try to explain to my friends in China is you've got a patchwork of 50-50 entities, all of whom have their own constitution, legislature, uh, media. Uh, they're almost like independent nation states. And so they all have their own set of priorities and their own goals and aspirations and relationships within the country and, and externally. So you're gonna find that in each case you, you get a little different response, which is truly the American way. <laughs> you're the only American since the establishment of diplomatic relations with China to serve as both uh, ambassador to the People's Republic of China and ambassador to Russia. So you have a unique understanding of both countries. Where do you, I mean, where do you see the Russia-China relationship going in the future? And what are the implications for the American people? They're, they're both uh, long, proud civilizations, uh, one dating back 5,000 years, the other 1,000 years. Uh, being uh, large border states, Russia and China, uh, they're not natural friends and allies because border states typically are not, particularly with a border as long as theirs. And if you look at the late 60s, you know, how close they came to nuclear war uh, over border disputes. This is not a match made in heaven. And I've watched this relationship for a very long time. And I'm, I'm asked a lot about, well, what about this relationship? And, you know, is it really as deep as we're led to believe? I don't think it's that deep. I think it's very superficial. I think the tr it's, it's very transactional. So what does Putin want? Putin wants to be seen in the presence of Chinese leadership. It brings him what he craves, which is legitimacy and credibility. I hate it every time I see it because I don't want Putin to get legitimacy and credibility. I think what he's doing on the world stage is horrific. And what he's done in Ukraine is just beyond words. Uh, and needs to be dealt with. And I'm glad the United States is playing its proper role in, uh, in engaging there. And I was heartened by what I heard uh, Li Keqiang say in the last couple of days, which is uh, they're embarrassed by the actions of Putin. I've long thought from the beginning that of course they're embarrassed behind the scenes by what Putin is doing. He mentioned words like sovereignty, the importance of sovereignty. I mean, this is, this is speaking our language. Uh, international law, international rules, sovereignty. So yes, we in a sense, the United States have given Russia and China reason to team up because they don't like our values. They don't like our position on the world stage. They don't like uh, our influence in international organizations. They don't like our sway. Okay, <laughs> I get that. Um, but long-term, I think that linkage between Russia and China is, 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 is deleterious to, to China's interests and I, I think Putin will largely be done in by his own people at the end of the day. This has become such a disaster that it will become a two-front war for him. One he's losing, which is in Ukraine, uh, when we look at the retreat from Kherson most recently. And the second he's losing too, which is with his own people. We just haven't seen it manifest in marches and demonstrations and, uh, and other it's things. It can't, yeah. But I think we'll see that. Follow-up question from Ken in Denver, Colorado on exactly this point. Hello, Ambassador. I'm Ken from Denver, Colorado. My question is, wouldn't it be in America's best interest to set aside differences with China and reconcile with them and even have friendlier relations with China, especially since we might need Xi and China to put pressure on Putin to end his war and to dissuade him or prevent him even 
from using nuclear weapons, which is the biggest concern. What do you think? Yeah, it, it, it's a great point. Uh, but I think, Ken, and thank you for the question, and Denver's a great place, it's close to my home in Utah. I think the best pressure exerted on, on Xi Jinping is through the failures of Vladimir Putin. I think that speaks for itself. Um, can we come together just like that and sort of make it all whole between the United States and China? Certainly not. We have some irreconcilable differences. And we sometimes waste a lot of uh, words and airtime speaking on issues that are not easily resolved between the two of us. We just have to be smart enough to say, this is the basket of issues that we cannot resolve. Let's manage them so that we don't end up in a confrontation that could destroy the world. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you've got a basket of issues that deserve some real reflection in terms of the overlapping interests that we have in certain areas. And that, sadly enough, is something we have not spent enough time on. So I think the dance between uh, Xi Jinping and, and Vladimir Putin is, is gonna be short-lived, just like the relationship generally. So they came together 100 years ago to create the Communist Party of, uh, of China, uh, then the military, the PLA shortly thereafter, and then they had an estrangement over what? Ideology, right? And if you go to the Great Hall of the People, the Renmin Dahuitang, you see that it's half architected by the Russians and the roof is Chinese, of course, representing that split in 1959, 1960 over ideology. So this is on again, off again. So I don't, I don't much obsess about what they're doing although they are going a bit deep as it relates to intelligence and security ties. They've done some military exercises in, in Siberia uh, that I've followed closely. But Ken hits on something that's really important, and that is the issue of nuclear weapons. So strategic stability, this is a big issue, and one that we have been in talks with, with the Russians since the early 1970s, since the days of the strategic arms limitation talks. Uh, and we've had successful efforts around START and New START, starting in 2010 with President Obama, which really limits the number of deployed uh, big weapons, uh, strategic nuclear weapons, and then the number of delivery systems that can be deployed. We've never had such conversations with China, largely because, as they would say, we don't have 4,000 or 5,000 weapons. And when we do, we'll come knocking. Well, <laughs> I've, I think that's a disingenuous answer because nuclear weapons are nuclear weapons. Uh, they can wreak havoc and destruction and destroy the planet. And to me, that is the most existential threat that we have in the relationship. So if part of <clears throat> an extension of managing a bilateral relationship based upon our interests, right at the top of that list should be nuclear weapons and what we do about it in terms of understanding what the aspirations are, both sides, nuclear safety, strategic stability, uh, proliferation, uh, issues of safety protocol is around transportation, researching and testing. There's so much to it that we have not even started. The journey hasn't even begun. So I think Ken brings up, I think, a very, very key point, and that is my hope is that whatever list is being made between the United States and China, that strategic stability is right there at the top. Yeah. It seems that there was some discussion of, of uh, nuclear weapons, and, and the Chinese have recently uh, been restating their no first use policies. So there, there seems to have been some, some uh, effect of these discussions. Um, when I met with people, you know, people who you were dealing with every day, I would deal with periodically, the national security, the equivalent of the national security advisor of, of of China, and, and he said, you know, the American people need to understand, you know, the President of the United States gets up and he gets his national security briefing and he's briefed on Afghanistan, Iraq, Venezuela, and these things. The President of China gets up and he's briefed on Tibet, Sichuan, Xinjiang, et cetera. How do we kind of right-size the China challenge, the China threat? and be careful not to inflate the challenge that China poses. Listen, I'm a, I'm a human rights advocate and uh, I, I don't like what I see in certain corners of China, I never have. And I've been banned from the internet once before for speaking out, out about it. 
But here's how I try to explain it to my friends in the United States when we look at both countries in their respective geographic locations. You know, we, we've been given in the United States the greatest blessing in the world geographically. We have the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, the two most impenetrable barriers uh, any country has in the world. Canada's been a partner and ally, and Mexico we have a we have a good trading uh, and diplomatic relationship with. China, on the other hand, is surrounded by a, a dozen countries. Uh, domestically, uh, it's uh, a patchwork of provinces and, uh, and autonomous regions. And But I think it's China's recent history that really tells the story. We had, obviously, a bloody civil war back uh, in the 1860s. But when you look more recently at China's trajectory, you see things like uh, the Great Leap Forward. You see things like the Cultural Revolution. You see things like what happened in June of 1989, um, the Tiananmen Square uprising. So domestic stability is, is a real concern and traditionally has been in China. We look externally <clears throat> because we can afford to do so. We've had domestic tranquility for well over a century. In China, they don't have that luxury. So when the numbers get out of balance, unemployment, inflation, people differing on issues from private property rights to whatever else it might be, it can be a flashpoint very, very quickly. So you bet Xi Jinping wakes up and he looks at his dashboard indicators starting with how stable am I domestically? Right. He hopes and wishes every day for tranquility externally, but I think his obsession really is the domestic front. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean for kind of the United States thinking about its policy? You know, we're obviously, if you look at our defense strategy now, we're going to be spending uh, tens of billions of dollars that's not going to go into education, social programs, infrastructure. Is that right-sizing the challenge? Well, <laughs> We don't, we don't always see it the way we just described. So if you were to sit down with national security folks, particularly the military, they, they, they are not much concerned about the domestic circumstances in China. We might be. We've lived there. Uh, we understand m much of how the country works and where kind of some of the weak spots are. The, the military is obsessed with the external environment. Uh, our friends and allies in the region, keeping the sea lanes open for the free flow of trade and commerce, uh, being uh, loyal to uh, international law and our obligations. So they're going to see it a little differently. Mm -hmm. But right-sizing, if you were to try to explain that China's real obsession is domestically, a lot of people would say that's impossible because they're bullies in the region. They do this and they do that. And it takes a while to explain the history of China that brings you right around to their obsession with the domestic situation. Of course, Taiwan is pulled into the domestic situation, mm -hmm. as would be the South China Sea, the Senkaku, and, and, and same with Hong Kong and Macau back, yeah. in, back in earlier years. It was certainly interesting that President Biden in his news conference after the meeting said that uh, China will, is not prepared to imminently invade Taiwan. There's been a lot of discussion uh, among think tankers, among the U.S. military, that they now have a timetable for that. Do you agree with Biden? That, that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. It, it's that an assumption I've been operating under for quite some time. I've lived on both sides. I've lived in Taiwan twice. Right. Um, I've known it from the days of uh, martial law back in the late 1970s. I think you were around. I was a student there, yes. Then, then too. Right on through to... Earlier, I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> right on through to early democratization, let's say with the passing of Zhang Jingwa in 1987. I was living there at the time, so I saw uh, the rise of democratic forces, the freeing up of the media, the legitimization of opposition political parties, uh, the return home of Xu Xinliang, who had been living, of course, in Massachusetts as a, as a political refugee, and the rise, of course, of Li Donghui. And all, all, all of that giving, you know, shakes and jitters to folks on the other side of the, the Taiwan Strait. Uh, but, but, but there you have it. Yeah. I, I don't think there's, there's, a, there's an immediate threat there. Of course, in politics, people in power are required to say certain things to appease certain factions of their political movement. That's just a given. And then you have to take a step back and say, okay, 
what is the reality here? Right. And I think the reality is more in line with what the president has said. Right. Which leads us to the next question from Arena Leo here in New York. Hi, I'm Irina Liu, and I'm an alumni from the Schwartzman Scholars Program. I'm submitting my question from New York City. And my question to Ambassador Huntsman is, Are you have you been surprised by General Secretary Xi Jinping's um, policy direction or changes in the past decade since you've been ambassador to China and since he's taken power? Would just love to hear your reflections on that. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. That, that is a, a loaded and important <laughs> question. Um, I'm always surprised uh, about what I see and experience in China. I was surprised by, by Deng Xiaoping's uh, op opening and reform uh, commitments mm -hmm. and priorities. I mean, who would have guessed that that soon after the death of Mao Zedong and the kind of abolishment of the Gang of Four I mean, literally years after the Cultural Revolution ended, that you'd have that kind of opening. Did, did that surprise? You bet. I think it probably surprised anybody who was awake at the time. And similarly, kind of the drift toward more statism, starting, I think, with the 18th Party Congress in 2012, uh, the kind of the, the rise of Leninism within the system. We all knew it was a Leninist system just by way, the way it's constructed, but the use of the state to promulgate more of the policy making was, I think, er early signs. The desire by Xi to strengthen the party, uh, realizing it was the only governance source that they had uh, through the anti-corruption campaign. And then the 19th Party Congress, and more recently, more Marxist features on the economic side. So if it was, you know, 50-50 state, uh, free market, state market in earlier days, it becomes more 80-20 state uh, market. So the movement toward greater state participation in the economy, uh, the, the, the roles of state-owned enterprises, uh, and, in, and in general, the crackdown on dissent uh, and differing opinions, I think is mo most recently vividly displayed by the restructuring of the Standing Committee of the Politburo. I think it's got to surprise any observer. Of course, Xi Jinping, or Xi Jinping is who he is. He's the son of Xi Zhongsun. He has a certain mandate historically that he's felt, and I think we've always seen that. But the, the move toward greater ideology uh, in governance, greater use of the state, which to me means greater isolation generally, is not a good and not a healthy thing, and I expected a little more from Xi Jinping in terms of how he would handle how he would handle that. His decision to go for a third term, I don't. I mean, just personally speaking, I, I don't think is a good one. Uh, I, I think that leads to drift. Uh, I think it uh, it it uh, it it keeps the the fifth and the sixth generations of leadership uh, off the playing field, which would have allowed a, a new infusion of ideas and energy into the system. So yeah, I've been I've been surprised by by a number of things, but nothing in China surprises me. Does the you know, again like you, I've been dealing. I'm slightly older, as I was saying before, but I've been dealing with China for 45 years, and and the pendulum swings back and forth. It's it's part of, you know, the Chinese political and economic situation. Do you think the pendulum swings back towards a, towards the private sector, away from the state sector, because the data. I see a lot of data. The Chinese see more data than, than I do and better data than I do. They need to change some economic policies. Don't you think they know that? Well, if you stop to conclude that economic growth is of paramount importance to the Chinese system, without which they cannot remain a stable nation state, I think that that's a true statement. And I think it's recognized widely in Chinese leadership, and the answer is yes. So what happened after Tiananmen Square in June of 89? when the approval by Americans of China was roughly 17% ap approval, probably worse than it is today. So I, I- Same. Yep, pr probably roughly where it is. So, so what happened in the years after that? Well, they supercharged economic growth because investment fell to practically zero. And they had to supercharge economic growth because that was the only uh, remedy for domestic stability 
creating jobs and growth and an opportunity for people. So I think you're right about the pendulum. I'm just sometimes surprised at, at, the, at the width with, with which it swings. The Biden administration talks about, uh, or Jake Sullivan talks about, invest, align, and compete. The align portion of that is our allies and friends around the world. We need to have a policy that, that is cons consistent among our friends and allies. Why is that important and are we doing it? Well, first of all, Steve, we have to have a network of uh, allies and friends to, uh, to project our values. So we come together as a community of nations around certain values. And we are who we are as Americans. We have certain values and uh, they're inherent to who we are as people and our national journey and our national experience. And gladly some of those values such as human rights and uh, the importance of democratic principles uh, are shared by other countries. And uh, so yes, indeed, we are better and stronger and more stable as a world when we align with like-minded countries. My only complaint, at least one, I would have maybe a few, but one of my big ones is how are we nurturing those alliances and what are we doing to keep them strong and to keep them relevant? Well, I get back to trade. So what are we doing on the trade front to, to freshen up our presence in the Asia Pacific region? Well, I don't think we're doing nearly enough. Uh, we're not talking about market access. We're talking about issues that aren't necessarily germane and relevant to all of our trading partners. So I go back to what uh, President Bush and President Obama talked about with TPP, and it was dismissed by, uh, by President Trump. And I thought it was a huge mistake. Uh, so something that gets us back to a TPP framework that really allows uh, a family of like-minded trading nations sharing common values, not just in the political realm, but also in the economic realm, to come together and build and grow. Well, it's not only good for the members of the trading block, but it's also good for those who want to get in the trading block, like China. So if you want to deal with issues like intellectual property theft, uh, market access concerns, the role of state-owned enterprises, uh, et cetera, et cetera, set the example. You know, it, talk and words are very limited in terms of their impact. If you're living it by way of a block of nations actively practicing these things, people are going to pay attention. Yeah. So the CPTPP is the successor to the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Any chance that with a republic, are there enough pro free trade Republicans to combine with Democrats to kind of get negotiating authority for the president to restart those discussions for joining the CPTPP? So if you're divided ideologically within Congress, getting back to some of our original yes, discussion, yeah. then the answer is it's really complicated <laughs> and a lot more difficult because it, it, at the right end and at the left end, you have uh, antipathy towards yes. trade. So I'm saying, is there a big right. enough middle? I think so. I think there's a big enough middle where you can extend uh, trade promotion authority uh, you know, through the Ways and Means Committee, which is absolutely critical to the trade agenda in combination with the Finance Committee and the Senate to actually get us back in the, in the trading game. I think it's the most powerful thing we can do in the Asia Pacific region. Yeah. Our commander of uh, Indo-PACOM in prior uh, during the Obama administration said it was worth Davidson. a bunch of aircraft carriers. Yes. That the, joining the TPP <laughs> was worth a bunch of aircraft Yeah, carriers. coming from somebody with four stars on their shoulders, yes. that's quite a comment. It's, it's a big, um, let's talk somewhat about uh, anti-Asian discrimination. And, and uh, Clay Jew from, from uh, San Francisco has a, uh, a question. My name is Clay Zhu. I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. In recent years, the U.S. government has taken a lot of law enforcement actions against Chinese Americans in the name of national security. The DOJ has a program called the China Initiative that is supposed to target espionage by Chinese government agents. Those cases are often dismissed by the court because there's no evidence, or a few of the defendants have been charged and convicted of very minor or technical violations. This reminds me of the many episodes in the U.S. history where Chinese American people were discriminated or treated differently. How would you advise the U.S. government to address this ugly trend towards Chinese American people living in this country? Thank you. 
Well, Clay, that, that, that is such a good and such a well-articulated question. And it, it gets right kind of to my heart because my, my daughter is Chinese American. Um, and I live in a state that uh, was home to a place called Topaz, which was an internment camp for Japanese Americans during the World War II years. I've been to Topaz many, many times. I went there as governor and uh, helped to kind of put it more on the map because I think it, it tells an important story about what happens when we go to extremes in this country and the impact it can have still felt for generations following those decisions. So Clay, there are legitimate national security uh, issues uh, on a people-to-people -people level. I had to deal with them in China a lot. As we were opening Confucius Institutes here in the United States, we would try to open something similar in China and we could never get it off the ground because they always thought they were gonna be a center of espionage. And so it's an issue that, that goes both ways. And so I think we have to be very careful and very smart about how we define national security because there is a national security role in all of this. That should not be forgotten. But letting it wander off to some extremes, uh, we've learned those lessons in the past about what happens. And I would hope that uh, our government uh, would be smart enough to learn those lessons. National security, of course, has to be a consideration but how you define and draw those lines so that it does not become straight up discriminatory. Because that, that's not what the American experience is or should be about, uh, has got to be a driving force while allowing the flow of people from which we benefit enormously to be the priority. One final question. President Biden is flying back from Bali. He gets off the plane and you greet him. What do you tell him about follow-up for this trip? Let's ensure that whatever we do is focused on our express national interests, that the follow-up is done in a way that is a direct extension of those interests, defining a small roadmap list of priorities where our expectations should not be great in terms of immediate results because that won't happen. But if we go about creating a bureaucratic or a top-heavy bilateral sort of discussion group, it will fail. They failed in the past because they're just that, they're too top-heavy. You pull out your note cards and you read talking points back and forth, and in the end, nobody gets anything out of it. Where on the other hand, if it's a well-tailored agenda, and we all know the top three or four things that should be on it, uh, with the right handful of officials on a regular, routine, systematic basis, I think we, we can begin to stabilize what today is a relationship that has reached a very dangerous level. And then finally, I would say, let's avoid uh, point scoring. I can't tell you how many times we would try to get something done only to have point scoring jump in the way, which is the tit for tat. And I would be punished as a U.S. ambassador. And I know my counterpart in Washington, the Chinese ambassador, would be punished too. And I would, I would always stand in the way of legitimate progress. So that's got to be top of mind as we go forward. As I said in my introduction, you're one of the most remarkable public servants in the United States of America. You have served for five admi consecutive administrations. Um, any chance you'll serve in a Biden administration to make it six in a row? <laughs> well, I guess technically being on the Defense Department Policy Board, I qualify. I see. <laughs> oh, already. John, thank you so much. This was a real tour de force. Great thank honor, Thank you for Steve. your second time at Chinatown My Hall. My great pleasure. And thanks to all of the viewers who are taking the time and have the interest in being part of this dialogue. It's a healthy and important thing in, in, the, in the phase of our bilateral relationship. All right, thanks. Thank you, Steve.